things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Somebody who's really born again, they will change. It'll take a while. Some things will be immediate. Some things will be a process. But things change. See then that you walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. The scripture says that someone who says there is no God is a fool. It says it directly. He says here, don't walk like a fool. We say, how do people walk like a fool? People who take the scripture, people who take the scripture and treat it like it's a smorgasbord, you know, like a buffet line. And they say, well, I'll believe that because that suits me. But I won't believe this. I mean, I have my own feelings about that. Friends, that's a fool. The scripture admonishes, admonishes us to live by the whole counsel of God. You know you've really started to arrive when you don't need a reason to believe what God says. When you can earnestly say, God said it, it's good enough for me. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. God wants you to know his will for your life. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, why would he compare being filled with the Spirit with being drunk? you would think that those are 180 degrees out from each other. Here's the connection. Those that make wine, their absolute and immediate go-to thing when there's trouble to the point of being sloppy drunk are searching for something. They're searching for an alteration in reality. They're searching for a change that makes them feel better. They're looking for that. And what he's saying here is, this isn't a statement against alcohol. This is saying that if you have to use something that alters your perception of reality, you actually need to do something that is going to edify you and it's going to bring honor to God. Because when the Spirit of God is active in your life, you'll find all the things that you were looking for in a bottle or in a needle in your arm. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in, in, in your heart, to the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm by myself driving long distances. Sometimes I have my own sing fest. And there's nobody in the car to criticize me. I know in my heart of hearts, God loves it when you sing to me. It's right here. He says it. Teach your children to sing with you. Have a sing inspiration in your own house. <clears throat> sing together. God really likes it. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If your attitude is adjusted and you are thinking like God, 
then you will believe what the word says when it says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. If you sincerely believe that, if that portion of God's word is a reality to you and you say God said it, it's true. Nothing that comes down the pipe in your life will ever be seen as something that happened to you without God's permission. And you can thank him in the midst of it saying, Lord, this hurts now, but I know that you will bring this to good in my life. I believe it. I hold it. I won't turn loose to that. Like Job said, sitting in ashes with great sores, weeping, scraping them with rocks and dogs looking at looking them, his children dead, his wife turning her back and saying, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Tells those around him, even if he kills me, I'm going to serve him. Even if he kills me, I'm going to love him. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. No hardship too great to bear. Nothing in which you cannot have a grateful heart toward God. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Um, nobody knows you better than your spouse. So I've sworn mine to secrecy. <laughs> Come see me afterward. In the meantime, sit in the corner. Okay. I can tell you what tempers me sometimes. And it tempers me oftentimes in my dealings with other people that I know are believers. It came as a huge epiphany to me many, many, many years ago that my wife was not just my wife. She was the daughter of the king. It is unwise to mistreat God's daughter. It is not wise. And then that was the first epiphany. The next one is when he said to me, you know what I told you about your wife? Almost everybody sitting in the pews, they're my kids too. It tempered a lot of things in my life as a pastor. I would be very careful about walking in to a king's palace and even if I was right disrespectfully shaking my finger in one of the princes or princesses face king might not take well to that but in earnestness in love speak the truth and to do so as best I could to defend their dignity and to do it quietly and alone. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now guys, this next one takes a little explanation. Submitting our wives. How many wives we have in here? Amen. Amen. <laughs> wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord unfortunately in some places this has been 
horribly perverted. You cannot have the first part of this verse without an understanding of the second part. Wives, submit your, to your own husbands, first part, as to the Lord, second part. The re one of the reasons that Scripture prohibits believers to marry non-believers is because in that kind of covenant relationship, a wife can't submit to a non-believing husband. <clears throat> it's not the thing to do. The reality is there is an assumption here because it says, as to the Lord, that this is a godly, born-again man who has made a covenant commitment that has taken this woman in the presence of other believers. You know why we do that? It's giving all those who witness it permission to hold us accountable to our promise. Now, this has been used as an abuse from time to time where women have been beaten by non-believing husbands, have gone for counsel, and the counsel that they were given in church was, you. well, you need to stay right there. You need to continue to allow them to beat you. And I am here to tell you that that is not in the Lord. If you find yourself in an abusive situation, ladies, Walk out of that thing until you can get something resolved. I tell you, children, if your parents are compelling you to do things you know are ungodly, get out and get some help. Submission is conditioned on the other party being godly. Now, I know that there's teaching out there that says, well, you'll win your husband or your wife. There are limits. Submission isn't because a woman is less. A, captain, a ship can't have two captains. And basically, the first officer on the ship is perfectly capable of operating the ship. In fact, the reason the first officer is there is to be able to take command if something happens to the captain. It's not an issue of qualification. It's not an issue of capacity. It's an issue of order. Now listen to this. For the husband is the head of the wife. It's actually authority. The husband is the authority of the wife. And also Christ as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Why, why should we submit to Jesus? It's not because he's God and he's the biggest kid on the block, and he's capable of destroying everybody. If that's the basis of your salvation, come talk to me because you may not be saved. It's not a biggest kid on the block deal. He is righteous and he is good. He is love. He's everything that can possibly be good in a human being. And for that, I give thanks that he's also the biggest kid on the block. <laughs> I'm glad there's no one bigger. Nobody deserves that power more than God does. For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. I can submit to somebody who loved me so dearly that he died for me while I was yet in rebellion. I can submit to someone who has told me in no uncertain terms in his written word that he means me no harm, that he'll never leave me or forsake me. 
that he will always work for my benefit, that all things in my life are going to work out for good. Husbands, now he says, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Men and women are psychologically different. That's a fact. The world has tried to propagate a lie that there's absolutely no difference except, except anatomically. That is a lie. There are differences. A basic motivation that God has placed in women is a desire and a need for security. That's one of the big differences sexually between men and women. For men, the risk of a pregnancy, it costs men very little. For women, the commitment is huge. Two entirely different ideas. Because there is such a potential for all that a woman has to give to a family relationship, she should be careful to ensure that that relationship is cemented by a commitment from a man whose life philosophy has come from someone who knows something about commitment. And that's God. Now, remember we talked about the idea that there are limits to submission? Husbands, do you want your wife to love you? Then exemplify the kind of commitment and attention that Jesus gave to you in salvation. Someone talks bad about your wife, they need to be in fear of how you're going to respond. I had a, I had a conversation uh, once with a young man many years ago who decided he was going to scream at his mom. And that was the first time our relationship changed slightly. Because it was the first time he ever heard me say, she may be your mother, but she's my wife. And you need to know it. And nobody attacks me. That needs to be the relationship, guys, with the women in your life. That's the relationship that Jesus had. And when the enemy of our soul tried to rip us from the hand of God, he stood up and said, even if it cost me my life, I will not let my bride go. You want your wife to love you? Make that kind of commitment. Emulate God in his commitment to you as part of the bride of Christ. A woman has an easier time submitting to a man and giving him authority when she is convinced, convinced of his willingness to stand for her security. Daughters will be closer to a father who will stand firm in love and whom they fully believe that they enjoy his protection. You work the hours you have to work to make it work. You do what you have to do, not what you want to do. You stand for your family, though it costs you something. And unless your wife is a complete fool, she may just fall in love with you. Again and again and again.
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You know what? Love your wife deeply, she may actually change. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Uh, we have a modern saying that goes somewhere along that line. When mama's not happy, nobody's <laughs> happy. You want to be happy? Love your wife, make her happy. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Oh, that came from the first wedding ceremony, remember? That's when Adam and Eve were joined together. The difficulty with our society today is they don't follow this pattern. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That's leave and cleave. The problem in our society is it's become acceptable to cleave and leave. The commitment needs to be unbounded. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. In other words, Everything I'm telling you guys about the way you should treat your wife is the way I treat you as part of the church. Now copy me and treat her the same way. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Guys, if you love your wife like that, she will come to respect you. Wives, if you show due respect to your husband, you will draw him in. He will come to love you like he's never loved you before. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord God, please help us not to touch that stove. Please help us to be like you. Father, please help us just to be a chip off the old block. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.